All right, welcome everybody. So, um, second part of the lecture will be uh, related to Git and object-oriented programming or to revision control uh, more generally. So, um, these are going to be two parts and first of all I'd like to talk a bit about uh, revision control. Um, don't forget to register in Moodle. Here's uh, the, the information once again, so we can also reach you via, via email, for example, or you can actually just ask questions, which is once again really important for this sort of YouTube lecture. All right, so um, first of all, let's talk about revision control. This is usually also called version control or source code control. And uh, one defining feature of all these uh, revision control systems is that they um, maintain or manage a history of changes to a set of documents from uh, one or more persons. And uh, the, the fundamental design idea behind most revision control systems is that they uh, manage plain text documents. This can be something like uh, source code, of course. It can also be something like a LaTeX file or just a plain text file with, with notes. Um, and some of these systems also have extensions for binary files like um, Word documents or images and so on, but this is not such a common use case. So the, the focus of most revision control systems is on managing source code. All right, so um, in general, I already mentioned that they manage uh, some kind of history and uh, the history is often numbered. So we have for revision one, which is the very first uh, set of, of documents you import into the repository. Then the next uh, when you change something, you get revision 2 and so on and so on. Um, the important part now to keep in mind is that this does not have to be linear. So uh, a revision can have multiple successors and it can also have multiple predecessors. So um, the structure is more like a, a tree or a directed acyclic graph, it's sometimes called. Um, and I'll show you a, a visualization of that in a moment. So. Here we have our, uh, our repository and the starting revision is here number one. And over time, different revisions are, are added, for example, so-called branches, um, which contain development for uh, some kind of extra feature or bug fixes, for example. And we have a main line of development. This is sometimes uh, called the trunk or the master branch. Um, from time to time, we can also um, give a tag to a specific revision. So uh, revision four here gets tagged E1. So this is kind of a bookmark for this specific uh, revision. And if we uh, at this point make a release from our software, for example, and that gets a version number and so on, then we can always access the exact state of the uh, source code at that point. So here we have uh, other branches. Um, this one, for example, is discontinued at some point, so it's not updated anymore. Um, this branch and this branch are at some point merged back into the development, uh, uh, into the main branch or uh, master branch. Um, so what's whatever changed in between here is now integrated back into the, the main set of changes. And um, so, from this point on, of course, you don't have a tree structure anymore, but you have this directed acyclic graph where um, pa uh, parts uh, of these branches can flow back into the, the main line. Um, and this is also usually the point where, where you r can run into problems. So um, these are then called conflicts. For example, imagine that in in change set six and in change set seven, the same file was edited, maybe even the same line in the same file. Then what happens if we merge that back together? Because um, of course, two different people might have been working on that and might have made very similar changes or maybe even incompatible changes to the file. And uh, for this reason, sometimes when you do a merge, uh, especially between uh, branches from different people, then you uh, can't avoid having to like intervene manually and fix those problems and decide which ver version of the two uh, is actually the right one. Um, 
from time to time you can also uh, integrate, for example, changes from the main line into a branch. This is also possible, um, so that you don't don't diverge from the main branch too much, especially especially if several people are developing on the same uh, bit of software. Um, but in general, it's not entirely avoid avoidable to having to fix those merge conflicts from uh, from time to time. All right, so now let's talk a bit more about common terms that you will encounter when using any sort of revision control system. Um, a repository or short repo is basically just the, the storage for all the, the files and also for all of the history of the uh, development, which is usually on some kind of remote server. The working copy is then your local uh, installation of the files, which usually have just one specific revision. And uh, common examples, uh, which are more of historical interest by now for this sort of uh, version control, are CVS or Subversion, which is usually abbreviated SVN. And so the, the how you use them is that uh, first you initialize your local copy your working copy from the repository. This is called a checkout. And then later on, you uh, make so-called commits to the uh, to the server and update your, uh, your copy with other changes that other people have committed to the server. So this is the, the process for uh, the basic process for older revision control systems, which just have one central server and um, exchange data with individual working copies. Um, by now, most people actually use uh, some kind of distributed revision control systems, so we don't have um, these separate working copies anymore, but every uh, installation basically is a complete repository that has the whole history and um, each repository in theory has the same the same level of importance uh, so it's basically a peer-to-peer -peer system with interconnected repositories an example for these are bazaar mercurial and git especially git of course um, this is the most popular version control system by now, and especially in, in any sort of open source uh, development context, this is quite widely used. And here now we're using slightly different terms. So um, let's assume that this is the uh, repository on your computer, and these are uh, other repositories. Uh, so now the operation to create a new copy of another repository is called cloning. Um, when you make a commit, then this will actually only change your local history, so no other repository will at first uh, be, uh, be aware of these changes. So commits are only ever happening locally, and this is something that's very important to keep in mind, because there's another step now that you have to, uh, to do, which is to actually um, push actively push the uh, changes to any other repository where you also want them to show up. And uh, if other people then want to integrate those changes or uh, update their local copy of the repository, then this process is called pulling. So you push changes to a remote repository and you pull changes from the remote repository back into your own one. And um, if you make a commit, then this is only happening locally on your own uh, copy of the repository and nobody else uh, sees it yet. So, um, all right, let's I'll go into more detail as to how this works in, in, in practice in a few slides. So, uh, oh, right, <laughs> I almost forgot about that. Um, what common terms are in this context of distributed revision control systems is that uh, a repository which you cloned from and where you push your changes to is called upstream and your repository on your local machine uh, is called downstream and as you can see you can have even change, cha uh, chains of several repositories where um, the uh, this one is now 
basically downstream from that one and this one is downstream from that one and so on and changes can actually propagate through several repositories uh, with with additional changes sometimes uh, this is actually how a lot of open source development happens now all right so one additional operation that most revision control systems offer and which you should definitely uh, uh, take advantage of is diff diff is short for difference and this means you get a highlighted view of what changed between two uh, files and usually um, you get a view like this where removed lines are uh, often red and are prefixed with a minus and added lines are green and prefixed with a plus um, depending on what options you have, you can even see which which word in a logger line or which part of a logger line actually changed. And of course, this again works best for plain text documents like source code or um, or LaTeX source, for example. And here in the example, you can see. Uh, the output from diff uh, on the command line. So here you can see wh wh what the actual file name was. Uh, A and B refer to the different versions that are being compared. And here this line was uh, removed and replaced by two other lines. Um, once again, if you have a, the right configuration and you just change a part of one line, don't replace it, but just change part, then you can even see only that changed part highlighted. And this is really helpful of um, keeping track of what you changed maybe three revisions earlier to, um, for example, to, to figure out uh, whether uh, you introduced a bug somewhere or something like that. All right, so uh, what best practices are um, suggested for revision control systems in general? Um, so commits should be rather small so any every time you should you, you make some kind of meaningful change to your source code you should actually commit it this is not something that a uh, lot of people follow through but it's still a, a good idea in general and also you should only have la uh, only related changes in one commit so that means that um, if you work on three different features in your code then don't put all of those changes into one commit, but actually make three separate commits. That also makes it easier to keep track of what, track of what changed uh, later on. Then don't use commit messages like here in the example. Um, this is also something that happens a lot, but especially if you're working together with other people, then using actually meaningful commit messages uh, can help a lot to yeah keep track of what's going uh, to happen. Um, don't commit code that doesn't compile. So at the very least, it should compile it. In, in the best case, it should also be already tested and working. So before it doesn't work, then ideally you shouldn't actually commit it. Um, a lot of people use Git and so on as a backup. It's it's not a backup. So if you for example, if you forget to commit something, then it's not going to be in the in the repository, also not upstream. And uh, if your hard disk crashes, then it's still gone. So um, it can be kind of a, a a separate backup just for code that uh, might occasionally help you out, but. Um, it's not something you should actually rely on. You should still have a separate backup. Then um, there's graphical tools like TIG and GitG, for example, which give you this sort of view of the different branches. So you don't have to actually do that on the um, command line all the time. It's actually a good idea to use something that gives you a more um, more understandable view of how the different branches uh, relate to each other and that is just a, a help you should actually you should actually allow yourself to have all right so much for best practices when using vision control um, how does this look like in in reality if you um, work on an open source project so especially with github um, Let's assume you already have your uh, your clone from the um, repository. Then you, uh, for for an open source project, then you can pull what changed recently in the upstream repository. 
Uh, for example, check for new issues. If you find an issue that you would like to fix, then you create a new branch. Um, in that branch, you fix the, uh, fix the issue, you test it, you commit it. Then the branch gets pushed uh, to your own GitHub repository. And then last but not least, you create a so-called pull request for the master repository. Um, I'll show you a graphical example because this is maybe better to understand here. There's usually uh, in such an open source workflow, there's three different repositories involved. So let's say, uh, say you want to work on uh, the Linux kernel. Uh, then this starts off with uh, the Linux repository on GitHub, which is owned by Linus Torvalds. And the first thing that happens now is that you create a, a fork. This is very similar to a clone, but the fork will still live on the GitHub server. So then you have a second repository that's also called Linux and which contains exactly the same history, but now it's owned by you. Next step would then be that you create a clone of that uh, Linux repository on your local machine, uh, which is then a complete copy, which is actually quite large for the Linux kernel, so it's several gigabytes. Um, but now you have your local copy. Then you can develop on that, um, make one or more commits uh, with, uh, with changes. For example, you, you build a new driver or you fix an, an issue or whatever. Um, now you have several changes on your local machine after you made a commit that are not yet any anywhere else. So the next step now is that you push the changes from your local uh, machine back to your um, back to your own repository in GitHub. So now these two will contain exactly the same content and they will have uh, a couple revisions on top of what's already in the original Linux repository. So now in GitHub, you create a so-called pull request, which is exactly what the name says. Is it, it's a request to the owner of the uh, upstream repository to pull specific changes from your repository into the uh, into the original one. And if all goes according to plan, then this is the last step. Then the owner of the upstream repository will uh, pull your changes into their repository and then all three will be at the same state again. But it's kind of a little bit involved. It's more involved than just downloading a zip file, but in the long run, and especially for larger projects, it's really helpful to have this sort of distributed um, version history. All right, so much for the part regarding revision control. This is also something you'll be doing in the, in the exercises uh, in practice quite a bit. So um, it's probably a good idea to already set up a GitHub account if you don't already have one. And yeah, apart from that, um, see you soon in the second part of this uh, lecture block.